there at Mount St. Helens, we discovered uh, something like 20,000 upright objects on the bottom of the lake. And what would Spirit Lake look like if you drained it? It would look like a forest that grew there. But it, it's not a forest that grew there. It's a transported forest or a replanted forest on the bottom of this lake. And the whole, uh, whole configuration there suggests that uh, there's some other explanation, perhaps, for the petrified forests at Yellowstone. And so that's, uh, th that's interesting to see the process. And we looked critically at the Yellowstone petrified forests and some of the so-called evidences of rooting in place of those petrified stumps, especially the vertical ones, aren't as strong as we thought they were. And the soil zones between the layers uh, doesn't appear to be soils. And some of the tree rings seem to correlate on different levels, suggesting that forests where their root ends buried at different levels grew at the same time falsifying the petrified forest interpretation. So uh, petrified forests don't appear to be a conclusive argument for a great age of strata. And then coal beds deposited in petrified forests don't appear to be a conclusive argument for a great age of strata. And then coal beds deposited in peat swamps. I told the story of the um, uh, of, of coal beds, uh, especially Kentucky coal study I've done. and thinking about floating log map model for the origin of coal. And then seeing Mount St. Helens produce a log map and all kinds of accumulation of broken plant material on the bottom of the lake, especially a peat layer up to three feet thick with sheets of tree bark abundant in the peat, having the appearance, if it was compacted and altered, of some of the coal beds we see in Kentucky and in the eastern United States. So coal beds deposited in peat swamps maybe uh, need to be reinterpreted and maybe not a, uh, not a swamp at all, but maybe uh, uh, underneath a floating log mat. So, so a log mat model for the origin of coal could happen rapidly, such as the peat accumulated at Mount St. Helens. And then the final one is radioisotope dating. And, and I, I want to bring up another issue just so this is one you can see this is the best piece of evidence that the age of the earth is wrong there is yet, that we have yet erosion rates you can anybody can go outside of their house and see this with their own eyes <clears throat> this was first pointed out to me by James Neenheis um, and others have I've heard discussing it as well uh, but I discussed this on a show earlier this year, so I'll just say it briefly, and then I'm going to play another clip here about this from the Grand Canyon. It's just any of you can go look at, go to where a riverbed is and see the slopes of the hill up, um, going up out from the river and f see the erosion happening and then realize that there's no way this all could have existed for millions of years. Okay, I mean, go in a place where there weren't glaciers, for example. Do this in Florida, uh, Texas. And th there's just simply a problem, okay? If the earth was old, all of this would have been washed flat, or, or there wouldn't be these spiky hills and mountains everywhere because erosion rates are just too fast. This is the most obvious, see it with your own eyes, verification. of. I'm not saying, I'm just saying that the age of the earth has to be radically questioned that there is. Okay, all that the professionals have are their old radioactive radioisotope dating methods and it's just widely and well known that those are they do give ages for an old earth but their numbers are all over the map. They can't get consistent numbers and there's just big problems so you know when there's just mountains of evidence on the one hand that the age of the earth is should be rise revised radically younger and then the one dating method that the professionals have can't be made consistent you got to start to see where the evidence falls but anyway here's this clip about the Grand Canyon and the erosion rates just amazing I this is my favorite kind of stuff on this show because everybody can just go and see it with their own eyes okay there's I don't need to just give you some documents I don't need to try to explain some scientific journal to you some theory I could just say go and use your eyes and go walk around a river valley and you'll see it here's the clip uh, catastrophic process 
Large canyons, big rivers used to convince me of long periods of time. And when I first saw the Grand Canyon, I was thinking in terms of long ages and slow process. Did the Colorado River cut Grand Canyon? As I studied that issue, and most geologists have uh, generally gone along with this, it doesn't appear that there's a 70 million year record of erosion of the Colorado River in Grand Canyon. There appears to be some kind of abrupt, um, almost instantaneous event that positioned the Colorado River through the Upwork Plateau in northern Arizona. And it leaves open a, 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 a young earth interpretation. And the small river in the big canyon uh, it doesn't look like it was a little water over a long time. It looks like a lot of water over a little time. And those petrified forests, like at Yellow, used to convince me a successive forest, I used to think in terms of... Okay, that was him on his radioisotopic dating DVD. Now for him on his Grand Canyon and Mount St. Helens DVD. And this is some of the most stunning information I personally have ever heard. And virtually everybody in academia simply ignores it. Doesn't refute it, doesn't present counter evidence, simply ignores it. <laughs> Here you go. On May 18, 1980, a catastrophic geologic event occurred that not only shocked the world because of its explosive power, but it also challenged evolution theory at its foundation. That event was the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 in Washington State. Eruption of Mount St. Helens. There in Washington State in 1980, in a very real and graphic way, a miniature laboratory was set up for the study of creation and catastrophe theory. An incredible series of events was set up by this rather small volcanic eruption that challenged our way of thinking. And I'd like to apply what we have seen at Mount St. Helens and what you can see at Mount St. Helens to other geologic features of the Earth. Well, this area of Mount St. Helens, uh, north of Mount St. Helens, was the a site of intense uh, uh, geologic activity. Up to 600 feet of strata formed here at this location. 600 feet of strata is, is a hard to believe, but since 1980, since May 18, 1980, up to 600 feet of deposits have formed here. And this area has been eroded since then to uh, show us some of the 600 feet of deposits that have formed here. What is amazing is the uh, minute layering that formed in uh, some of these deposits. We have historic observation and eyewitness reports and photographs of this area repeatedly between the eruptions showing us the sequence of which these deposits formed. Each layer has a date and I'm fascinated as I study these layers because each layer represents a geologic catastrophe formed since 1980. Uh, the, the one that comes to my mind most uh, uh, vividly here is behind us we see this layered June 12, 1980 pumice flow deposit. Hurricane velocity surging flows from the crater of Mount St. Helens came surging down right over this area in a matter of hours deposited 25 feet in thickness of strata and minutely layered strata. I had thought that a volcanic eruption would form hom a homogenized series of deposits. Boy was I wrong. Here are these uh, these flows moving at twice freeway speed through this area deposit this minutely layered uh, deposit. Uh, there are mud flow deposits here. There is the nine hour uh, eruption deposit from uh, the uh, nine hour eruption on May 18th. There's all kinds of uh, interesting features. This is a... Oh, okay, what he's showing here on the screen are different... Uh, it looks exactly like the Grand Canyon or some place where there's stratification layers in uh, what it usually are called told are sediments and I guess they line up exactly with different eruptions different lines for different eruption events of the volcano so these strata which look exactly like something you see elsewhere is coming from the different volcanic events over on May 19, 1982 sorry March 19, 1982 June 12, 1980 and May 18, 1980 this is a wonderland for geologists to study if you were here watching the, uh, the June 12, 1980 pumice flow deposit form, you'd be dead. Okay, it was that hazardous of an environment. Nobody actually saw the individual layers form. Underneath this uh, ground-hugging cloud of volcanic ash and steam, I suppose, uh, this layer formed. We believe it took minutes for individual layers to form. 
perhaps pulses. The eruption occurred in pulses, and this material came sliding down through this area. And uh, that's how we got the, uh, each, each, each of these layers. I had thought that a catastrophe would homogenize things. And I had thought that layers form slowly and gradually, like between wet years and dry years, or between summer and winter. And the boundary between two adjacent strata would represent long periods of inactivity, perhaps uh, um, you know, hundreds of years of nothing going on. Boy, was I wrong. Look at this. Uh, 25 feet of layers formed in just a matter of hours here at the volcano. Uh, this helicopter shot shows uh, one of these canyons, an incredible uh, new canyon.